Good morning and welcome everybody to our session six of using AI as a writing tool with AI Writers Connection contributing author Mira Gold. Lots to cover again today, so I will turn it over to you, Mira. Thank you and good morning. And as Gaylene said, welcome back to another enlightening chapter in our eGlobal Writing Salon series. I am thrilled to be your host once again for this sixth session, and today I have Lynn Jordan in the house. Lynn, can you please introduce yourself? I sure will. I'm Lynn Jordan, and I love AI and writing with AI because I love both tech and writing. This is my jam now. <laughs> oh, I can totally agree with you on that. It is my pleasure to usher you into today's session titled AI in Creative Collaborations. Now, there are so many different ways to collaborate. Whether you are doing that with an AI, a writing group, a critique partner, or maybe even a co-writer. So we're going to touch upon a few of those today. Now, I do want to stress that eGlobal Creative Publishing has actually embraced the innovative approach to storytelling, and they have opened their doors not only to people who like to write the traditional way prior to AI writing, but they're also open to individuals who use AI as an author resource in their writing endeavors. Our goal is to unite writers from diverse backgrounds, fostering an environment where creativity knows no bounds. So today's session, we are going to dive into the dynamic intersection of AI and human creativity in writing. We're going to explore the different ways AI tools can assist authors in co-writing endeavors, from generating initial ideas to even refining the final narrative. This session is not just about understanding AI as a tool, but recognizing it as a creative process that you can add to your writing craft trunk. We're here to show you how AI can be seamlessly integrated into your collaborative writing. Our objectives today, AI and creative collaboration. Our, ex our exploration begins with the role of AI in creative collaboration. We're uncovering how AI tools like, say, Jasper and Novel Crafters can revolutionize storytelling by offering fresh ideas and narrative paths. Our focus is on the blend of human creativity and AI's innovative potential in co-writing ventures, writing in a shared world. This can actually be a really fun and rewarding endeavor. We, when we venture into the realm of shared worlds, for instance, we have one in AIWC's Discord that is called Willow Creek, and we will use this as a prime example today. Within Willow Creek, we discuss the collaborative synergy and rich tapestry of narratives that emerge when multiple authors contribute to a single universe. It's about understanding the nuance of collective creativity. Benefits of co-writing. If you have never been a co-writer before on a shared body of work, and if that is something that you have an interest in, then definitely mingle, find out what kind of writing partner would work best for you. Dive into writing. Now, today, again, we are going to explore this shared experience and how it can increase productivity and balance workloads. The session is going to highlight how co-writing can lead to more dynamic and diverse storytelling, fostering a space for learning and growth among authors. Now, there are many different ways to actually collaborate, and we're going to discuss a few of those today. Now, Cece cannot be here with us today because she's a bit under the weather this week, but Lynn Jordan and I, we are working in a shared world, and we will talk about some of those. Also, we're going to cover some of the resources. We're going to examine some of the tools that you can use to facilitate collaborative writing, such as Google Docs, which is an online plat writing platform. The focus is on how these tools make co-writing or even critiquing one another's bodies of work more accessible and efficient allowing for real-time collaboration and feedback across different projects. Now, the other thing that we have to add to this is, what if you don't have an actual real person as your writing partner or collaborating with an actual real-life breathing person? What if instead you are venturing into using an AI to assist you with bouncing off ideas 
with sharing some of that task with an LLM. That's another area that we're going to touch upon today. Now, again, I mentioned critique partners. Critique partners is something that I ventured into back well before, say, 2012, when I really started writing fiction seriously. And having a solid critique partner can really help you, especially if that individual is writing in the same genre that you're in. And for me, I'm a plotter planner, so I often like to pair up with somebody who might be either a hybrid of a plotter planner and a pantser, or often I'll pair up with somebody who is a pantser because that kind of pulls me outside of my comfort window. And it's a nice learning experience for me to see how somebody else begins to form their plans, their ideas, how they structure their bodies of work. So again, with a critique partner, find that individual that you feel comfortable with. And it may take a couple of times before you find that person that you're comfortable collaborating with. We are going to cover Willow Creek as a shared world, and then we will move into a Q&A session and talk about what's on your mind. And then we will do a recap of everything that we have talked about. So let's go ahead and get started. AI in the creative collaboration process. Now, AI can serve as a catalyst in creative collaborations, merging traditional processes with technical advancements. It provides fresh perspectives, quickens ideals, and it helps to supplement human creativity. Now, notice I use the word supplement because AI cannot think like we do. As humans, we have that creative flair. We can sit, we can imagine different worlds, but an AI cannot think the way we do. Therefore, the AI is our creative tool. We can give the AI ideas and suggestions. We can guide the AI. So in a sense, we are the director sitting in the chair and we are giving or feeding the LLM or the AI our creative ideas, and then fleshing them out from there. AI tools like Jasper and Novel Crafters can propose plot twists and character arcs. But again, it's the information that we input that moves that process along. Now, Jasper and Novel Crafters, even Rexy and PseudoWrite, can offer writers with diverse options. Now, in the collaborative environment, AI can assist in developing characters. It can help you refine your dialogue and enhance your storytelling, acting as a bridge between authors and ideas. Now, the other side to that is, in addition to using AI, having a critique partner is a huge thing. I enjoy collaborating with Lynn, and I also enjoy collaborating with Nicole or even with Melissa and with Cece. And Cece and I have been collaborating for years. And the way that we collaborate from person to person as a writer may change. Lynn and I like to throw ideas around and we began to set up the whole Willow Creek little scenario. And as we're building it, we're bringing other people into the world and we are expanding that shared world and making it an area where writers can come in and learn and grow together. And that's one of the things that we love about a little shared world, especially when it's in a writing group. Now, CC and I, when we are working together, we tend to go in and flesh out whole bodies of work. Recently, we just did one for an alien sci-fi romance where we've used a galactic syndicate, a mafia style, but in a space. And we collaborated on the idea of the core structure of the storyline itself for the series. And then after we did that, I took off and plotted out four different story ideas for four different books within this series. I then sent that to Cece. Cece went over it, added additional content, and then I fleshed the story out for each one of the four books. But while I was doing that, Cece was actually going through and fleshing out 
a PNR series where we have shifters, like wolf shifters, bear shifters, panther shifters. And she took the idea that we created for that concept, then fleshed out that world. So that way we were both working on two different worlds at the same time, and then just passing the information back and forth so that we would have two different series that we're working on. We can generate those ideas, generate those story beats, and then generate all four books in each series, which gives us a total of eight books that we're going to be working on for Q1 of this year. Now, in addition to that, I've been working with Lynn with Willow Creek, and we also started another group for Yetiville because a lot of people started talking about Yetis and Bigfoot. We started a little town or village there called Yetiville, and we are expanding those stories. So again, find what works for you and having a group of people that you might give updates to to say, hey, I am on chapter three of my edit, and this is what I'm going to work on today, and setting those goals and having people that you feel responsible for in reporting where you're at helps keep you on track because it's not just you by yourself. It's a whole group of people that can give each other updates on where they're at in their story. For me, working in that kind of an environment allows me to be more productive. Now, we are going to work on a group activity today, which is going to be Willow Creek, and we're going to talk about that creation in just a little bit. Now, I've talked a little bit about writing in a shared world and how that creative synergy kind of propels or moves people forward. That shared world fosters that creativity, and it enables authors to co-create rich universes. And again, you don't have to collaborate with a real person if you're not at that stage in your career, do what is comfortable for you. I'm an extreme introvert, and getting out and meeting new people can be staggering for me or overwhelming at times. But within these little shared worlds, I feel comfortable engaging the authors who come into the world, and it allows me to move forward at a pace that's comfortable for me. Now, the workload of world building when you are in a shared world becomes divided among writers. For instance, I might have created a few of the towns like little businesses, but then Lynn Jordan also came in and said, hey, I'm going to write a story about a winery on the outskirts of town, and my first book is going to have a young lady who owns a flower shop. And then, Len, did you have something about a cafe owner as well? Would you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I would. As I started writing, my flower shop owner actually is meeting with the hero of the story in a cafe. Of course, that had to be Willow Creek Cafe. And I know exactly where that is. And I think, Mira, didn't you come up with a different cafe, a different I did. I did. So now we have two cafes, which means that eventually a story could be written about the two different cafes in competition with each other. Maybe one cafe is owned by a female, the other by a male. And maybe at some point, those two are going to find their own love story. Again, it's learning how to build this world and working with each other to creatively build different structures within it to give opportunity for other stories to spin off. Now, I love the fact that Lynn created a flower shop because now I can actually use the flower shop as just a side supporting role within my body of work. Maybe my male character goes in and buys flowers as an apology and enters into that flower shop. So again, it's actually fun to work in a shared world and be able to grow and see that world unfold. And that the would be very good if, because my flower shop is struggling. She needs all the business she can get. She needs all the business she can get. See, there you go. We need to have a few weddings in there so that she can really make some income there. 
and maybe even have some catering going on with some food. Now, the other advantage to a shared world is the cross-promotion. That means that if Lynn and Cece, Nicole, Melissa, and Angie and myself, if we're all riding in this world, that means that instead of just me promoting this body of work, that means that we have five, six, seven people who are cross-promoting this same shared world. Now, one of the things that I do encourage when people are writing in a shared world, especially if they are looking to self-publish, I recommend that if you get into a shared world, find one where you can actually publish on your own KDP account so that you can see how that structure works. And I think it's a good educational experience so you know exactly how much goes in to creating a body of work, having to take care of the cover, having to take care of all the edits, having to follow through with all the terms and conditions of a publisher. And let me tell you, as a writer who is both traditionally published and who also does self-publishing, there are so many things that I like about doing my self-publishing. Yes, I have the control, but at the same time, whenever I publish with a publisher, say eGlobal or even with other publishers out there that are traditional, I like the shared interaction. I like knowing that if I have a cover, I can get feedback on it. I like knowing that there is somebody that I can reach out to and say, hey, what do you think of this? If I am direct with a company, some places will even offer editorial services. So again, that's one of the things that you have to look at and where you're at in your career. Would you rather go traditional and have somebody else help you with the marketing and even assist you with some of the different facets of writing? Or are you comfortable where you're at and venturing into self-publishing? And again, I encourage writers to explore all different facets of writing because the more you know, the better equipped you are to handle your writing career. Now, there are some writers that I know who will never do self-publishing because they prefer to go with a publisher. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. And again, as a hybrid writer, I encourage you to try both avenues. Now, going back to our different opportunities for cross-promotion, collaborating with people really helps you learn from those different individuals. You begin to share techniques and perspectives, and there are specific areas where you may not be as strong, but yet somebody else may have a stronger viewpoint when it comes to world building. For me, I'm all about the world building, and I really enjoy watching authors who are character-driven writers who are very strong when it comes to their characters because I tend to look at their processes and see how they tackle things. And then it helps me to learn how I might be able to do that drill down deeper with my characters as well. As a writer, you are constantly learning. So always be open to new ideas and new opportunities. Again, the benefits of co-writing, it combines the expertise of different authors leading to well-rounded narratives, and it actually increases productivity. Now, with Cece and I working on two separate series for Q1, we're talking, she's working on four books, I am working on four books, and then when we are done with those four, we are going to swap, which means that at the end of that first quarter, we already have eight books that we can then turn around and either publish or send off to one of our publishers. So again, working with a co-writer allows me to increase my productivity, but I also map out time to do some of my own projects. And again, it I can't stress enough how much it helps to increase productivity because you also have somebody that you are giving updates to. And you're holding yourself accountable. Now, when it comes to that shared responsibility in research, writing, and editing, 
the individual burden is spread out and it allows that spark of creativity to move forward with that collaborative brainstorming. A writing partner also adds accountability, as I stated prior, ensuring that project milestones are met and the narrative remains on track. For instance, Lynn Jordan and I are working on Willow Creek. I have already generated all of my story beats. I have scrubbed up to chapter five, and my book is going to be 21 chapters, but we are keeping those lines of communication open to see where we are both at in our bodies of work, and we are collaborating. And by doing that, I know that Lynn's going to ask me, hey, how are you doing on chapter five? When do you think you might get to chapter six? And I can do the same with Lynn. And that way, again, we are holding each other accountable. And you can let me know when you've been in the casino in my small town. <laughs> we could do that on the outskirts. Who knows <laughs> what that's going to bring in? And there, there could be rivals there. And again, what was that? There, I think there was a racetrack too. So we're yeah, going to racetrack and big hotels. <laughs> There you go. They're just popping up everywhere. We're just going to have to see how that works with Willow Creek. Looking at collaborative tools and why resources. Why don't you explain why we chose Willow Creek? Okay, so Willow Creek. If you have used AI, then you know that the AI is going to spit out specific words all the time. And I don't care if you are writing PNR or you're writing an academy or even a contemporary Western romance, somewhere the town is going to come out as being Willow Creek. An academy is going to be called Willow Creek. Willow Creek pops up everywhere. And interestingly enough, Lynn and all of us were talking and we were in the pseudo Reich Slack community and we didn't realize that Willow Creek is actually a real little town or or subdivision, there's actually a real Willow Creek. Why don't you tell us about that, Lynn? Actually, there are a lot of Willow Creeks. There's a Willow Creek town in Northern California. And of course, I'm from Portland, and Portland has a lot of creeks, and one of them is Willow Creek. So we have the Willow Creek Transit Station. We have the Willow Creek Apartment. We've got lots and lots of Willow Creeks. In fact, when the Sudorite team came to town, they wanted to take a picture by a Willow Creek sign. So we all drove out to the Willow Creek Transit Station, and somewhere on the internet, there's a picture of the team and I standing behind the Willow Creek sign. Which is really cool because that phrase is constantly coming out in generations of different concepts. I I don't know, every time I am generating something, especially in, say, young adult or academy or within PNR, anything with a magical town, I'm constantly seeing Willow Creek. I even found Willow Creek in a middle grade that I was creating for a little town, and the school was actually named Willow Creek. So as writers, we tend to change that up so that we don't have that consistent, repetitive wording throughout all of our books. But Willow Creek was born because we want our Willow Creek books to have some of those repetitive, like little phrases. At least once in my Willow Creek book, I'm going to have the phrase, we're in this together. That is another phrase that you see often within AI. Another one is, we can do this. Another one that you might see is, take a leap of faith. So these are very consistent things that you see in AI-generated content. Same thing with piercing eyes. You might even see sparkling eyes or piercing green eyes. Every female, I'd say about 50% of the time, is going to be a redhead in AI-generated content. So these are some of the things that we are pinpointing so that writers who are using AI know that there are specific things that they might want to put on their list so that they don't have that redundancy across all of their books. Again, 
because it is AI and it is looking at predictive indexing and it is trying to guess from what you have fed it, what the next word choices should be, often you will see some of that repetitive content. So that's how Willow Creek was born. And it's become a little joke within the pseudo right community that Willow Creek, everything is Willow Creek. And so that's how we developed our little Willow Creek shared world. Now, going back to looking at our collaborative tools, we definitely want to set up opportunities for people to be able to share information. I believe, was it Nicole who set up that shared Google document that has a whole bunch of the different phrases? I think Ryan, one of the staff members of Sudarite had started that document, but people have been adding different phrases and words to that, which if people are interested, let us know in the comments and we'll be sure to link some of that information for y'all so that y'all can take a look at that stuff I'll, if I'll you are a, a member of Sudarite. Perfect. Perfect. Now, online writing communities are a great way to move forward but you have to make sure that you're actually writing. It's great to be able to communicate with other like-minded individuals, but make sure that you're actually spending time writing. It is so easy to go down that rabbit hole of communicating and joking and chatting and talking. And before you know it, your whole evening has been spent with chatting with everyone rather than writing. So make sure that you have a steady balance of when you're going to write and when you are just going to enjoy other people's engagement. Because again, if you're not writing, then you're not producing. Now, online communities and platforms, say PAD or PseudoWrite or other additional spaces for networking and co-authoring, can enrich that collaborative experience. But what I will warn you or caution you, make sure that you know the community that you are rolling into. Make sure that it is a community that aligns with the type of writing that you're wanting to do. If I were wanting to write maybe paranormal, historical romance, and maybe I want to turn the Battle of the Alamo into battleground between vampires and demons and werewolves, I may not want to join a community that is all about historical facts and ensuring that we align everything 100% with history. Because if I come into that group with paranormal characters, then that does not align with the group and what the group stands for. So again, make sure that you're researching the groups or communities that you are moving into and make sure that space is right for you. Collaborative tools and resources, Google Docs, Microsoft Word with Office, 365, Scrivener, and even Trilio. Trilio and Slack are some of those entities that can really help whenever you are looking at your content. So again, take a look at what you are doing, the type of tools that you are working in, and other areas that you can go into. Look at Evernote, Dropbox. You can go into Zoho Writers, Quip. There are multiple programs out there. Some people like to use Scrivener. And you can go into Gitbook. Novel Factory, Confluence, Notion. Now, I know that Notion is one of those that Lynn Jordan likes to use quite a bit, and she likes to embed some of her content in there. And I know Rexy is a tool through FFA, likes to use Rexy to maybe set up some of their story ideas, and a lot of people share their templates there. So it's a great place if you are looking to collaborate that you can share content between each other. Now, critique partners in writing. The role of critique partners in writing within that process, as I said, it can really help set the ball in motion. Your writing partner can offer constructive feedback and it can help to sharpen that narrative and develop your writing skills. 
again, there are things that I do as an extreme plotter planner. I want to know every part of my story before I sit down and write. But Lynn, on the other hand, she likes to, she will do plotting and she does do some wonderful plotting. But at the same time, she also does quite a bit of pan scene and she might be moving in a direction. And because she's a very flexible writer, if something's not working for her, she will do a complete turn and go in another direction if the story calls for it. That is something that as a writer who plots everything, from my perspective, seeing her do that and the flexibility in how she handles that kind of pulls me out of my comfort zone and allows me to realize, you know what, it's okay if I stray from a specific point if it's not working in my story. So again, working with the right critique partners can help you grow as an author. Now, constructive do feedback. My thing. You have to be willing to waste words. You do, especially if you are a pantser. How many different versions of chapter one do you have, Lynn? Quite a few. What (laughs) I like to do is I like to use the different LLM models and with the same chapter outline and then see how each model does it because each model has its own weaknesses and strengths. So I'll generate three or four different versions of the same chapter, and then I'll take the best parts for each one because I love options. So, Lynn, in a little bit, would you be open to showing us maybe one of those where you have maybe constructed multiple chapters in a little bit? I can show I can show how many chapter ones I actually have, and then I can show you my kit bashing, my, which is my mix and match when I'm pulling from different models. That would be perfect. So, We're going to go through a few more slides of our presentation for theory, and then that gives Lynn a chance to pull up some of her content. And then Lynn is going to share her screen so that y'all can see that information as well. So let's go to the next slide. While Lynn is gathering that information, we're going to talk about Willow Creek's unique universe. We're going to talk about that collaborative storytelling in Willow Creek engaging the community of writers and readers, and expanding the narrative with diverse voices. So at this time, I am going to go ahead and escape from the actual presentation because I want to show you what that collaboration looks like. So bear with me just a moment here. So on screen, you actually see a shared world. My shared world, if I go up to the top, It is Willow Creek. Now, can you confirm that you see Willow Creek shared world on the Google Drive? Yes, we do. Perfect. Willow Creek is actually that shared world that we have created within the AIWC Discord. And it is open to the public. Different people can come in there. They can participate or just hang around. It allows people to join that community ask questions about writing. Maybe somebody has questions about fleshing out a concept or has questions about beefing up their story beats. Those are all conversations that we have within Willow Creek. Now with Willow Creek and talking about our collaborative story, one of the things that we like to do is use the A and I prefer to use chat GPT four for the DALI three generation of images. So I fed the different town businesses within chat GPT-4, and it came up with the image that you see on screen. And let me show you the list. I fed this whole list to chat GPT-4, and it went ahead and created the image for me. Now, these are all the different areas within Willow Creek that people can write about. Now, I'm sure that we're going to be adding more content and fleshing out more of the different places within Willow Creek as time goes on. Now, looking, we had to have a backstory and lore for Willow Creek. Now, again, some of this information is going to continue to be expanded upon. And all of this information that you see here on screen 
Lynn and I actually generated within chat GPT-4. We wanted to know more information about Willow Creek. We fed it information about what the actual town looked like, where it was nestled. We wanted to know how it was founded, which it was founded in the early 1800s. So again, we are fleshing all of this out and having standard information. We have the masquerade, which is very common in paranormal romances for humans to not know about the supernatural world. Now, I like to write within a paranormal world with supernatural beings because that's an area that I tend to enjoy writing in. But now, Lynn, on the other hand, she's writing contemporary romance and does not have magical beings in her story, which still works because in our community, we have humans who do not know about the masquerade. And then, of course, we have supers and humans who do. So Lynn can write a body of work that is geared more toward humans who know nothing about the magical world. And she can write her couple that fall in love and the gentleman who owns the winery, the young lady who owns the flower shop, and the individual who owns the cafe. So again, he took my sweet small town romance and put all sorts of uh, supernatural elements in it. Yeah. So again, if you write supernatural, perfect. If you do not want to write supernatural into your bodies of work, you do not have to. So again, find what works for you. Again, we have big Bigfoot legends. We have historical events. We have a film of 1967, which was a turning point for the town. So we have all this information that we're embedding into the story. In addition, we have static characters. These are characters that people that are within this shared world can go in. So if I want to know information about maybe some of the past history of Willow Creek, I can go to the library that Lynn and I created, and I can go talk to Lena Murphy, who is a librarian, and she can pull up information for me. Now, she is a flat character, which means that she is the same character at the beginning of the story, and she's the same character at the end. She's only there as a static character for us to gather information. Samuel Green is the museum curator. Again, he is a static character. We have the description there and the image so that people know how to describe them. We also have Luna Martinez, who is the mystic brew owner. She has a coffee shop. We have Connor McAllister, who is the local conspiracy theorist. We have different characters that we play around with. We also have Grace Holloway, who is the antique shop owner. And we have Benjamin Foster, who is the town historian. This is a gentleman in his late 70s that has a wealth of knowledge. And he is a storyteller at heart. So if you need to know information and the librarian and Grace and the other characters do not know about that storyline, then chances are Benjamin will. So again, finding how to work within the world helps writers. If you are new and you are trying to flesh out a body of work, working within a shared world as, as a project and as a learning exercise can help you learn how to flesh out worlds. So again, we're always open to the general public and for writers who are looking to learn at how to flesh out a world. What authors should know about working in a collaborative world? The static nature, characters that do not undergo any significant changes, the role in stories, how they serve as only guides, interaction with the main characters, how they can provide backstory and lore and assist your main characters, and keeping consistency across different stories like Lynn and I if we are talking to Grace at the antique shop we want to make sure that my Grace and her Grace kind of align with each other so that's why we have static characters so Lynn would you like to go ahead and share your content I can certainly do that 
Okay, let me go ahead and stop sharing so that you okay. can hop on. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Okay, this is my Willow Creek story. And if you will see here, I have some story lore up here. But one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine versions of chapter one. And now, if you why see, do you have so many versions of chapter one, Lynn? Because I keep changing my mind about things or things are not good. Now, the good one, yeah, I think is the one that I did with the kit bashing. So I took all okay. these different models, generations, and I put them in a the kit bash. And I was calling that good. And I was happy with that. But then I started messing around with it, and so now I have better. So you just, if you're going to do this, I really strongly suggest that you really label them well. Let's see if I have the other ones labeled. So, Lynn, can you explain a little yep. bit about <clears throat> kit bashing and what that entails? I can. I was trying to find one that has a, usually I put the model number up there. Apparently here I didn't because they they fixed it so that it shows which model was generated. And this was one of the most accurate. I come up here to the first one. Now to Lynn's point, if you are going to generate multiple chapters using the same beats or some altered beats, if you are going to use the different LLMs within, say, PseudoWrite, make sure that you're labeling them so that you know which one's that you have actually generated. Often Lynn will put within her prose, she will add which one she has used either up in the header or down at the bottom of her prose. Lynn, while you're on that screen, can you uh -huh. do the little drop down on the generate chapter to show us sure. all the different LLMs yeah. that are available? Yeah. And see, I've gotten lazy about labeling it since they labeled it for me. So this is the best prose. Now, in early days, you, it did not show you that. If you went and generated multiple chapters and say you started with most accurate and then you went to your to generate a second version of it and then you went to best prose, it would automatically change all of the others. PseudoWrite went in and made a change to their systems. Now, it's easy for Lynn to go in and be able to look at which LLM was generated. Now here, you can see that it was done with best pros, but she has all these other LLMs that she can pick from most accurate, which is going to be chat or GPT-4. Your best pros is Claude. Balanced, that one is GPT-4 Turbo, correct, Lynn? Yes, it is. And then fastest is GPT 3.5. Unfiltered, that one is your Manser or Weaver, correct? Yes. It has no censorship. So if you're doing not safe for work, that's one that you can use. Now, then we also have the exper experimental ones like Goliath, Ereboros. We have Mythomax, Mixtrol. So all of those are some of the different ones that you can use. And if you look, at the bottom one, you'll see that it is new, the Mixtral 7B. That one is actually free under beta right now. Say you're in PseudoWrite and you've used all of your words or credits or tokens for the month, you can actually still go in and generate with the free beta if you wanted to. Go ahead, Lynn. Okay, I will show you my kit bash. Actually, this is not the template. This is the actual thing. I put the most accurate chapter here. I put the best prose chapter here. I put the balance chapter here. And then as I chose bits and pieces that I wanted, I put them in the merge prose chapter. And this is the one I put, and I put it over in the chapter labeled good. And I still, I ended up changing it. I don't know why we wanted sweat in the heat uh, because... Willow Creek is in the forest, and the real Willow Creek is in Northern California, which they don't get much heat. But see, we have the others, the scorching day. The morning sunlight is another cliche, and I'm still looking for that cliche document. I had it open, and I closed it a minute ago. So that, that's one of the things that the LLMs like to tell time with the movement of the sun. So. That's how I work. And yes, it takes longer. If you notice, I'm only on chapter two. 
And Marigold, what did you say? You're on chapter six or something? Yes. Now I've gener <laughs> I've generated up to chapter six, and I still have all well, up to chapter five. I'm fixing to do six, but it's interesting because I have up to twenty one chapters to get through, and I've been recording this one and putting each segment out to show the process that I'm following. Now, I am not one to generate multiple versions of the same chapter. Again, for me, I, I know a lot of people like doing that, and a lot of pantsers like to have those different options and to generate with multiple LLMs to get one of them somebody likes the dialogue on. Maybe with Best Pros, they like the dialogue. Maybe they like, in Most Accurate, they like the narrative. And that's why they will mix and match some of those. Me, I'm such a creature of habit. I like to generate once. <clears throat> and then depending on that content, if I feel that I need better or, or very punchy dialogue and I'm not seeing it, then I'll add that in as I'm writing or editing and doing my revisions. Now, I'll also do the same thing in my narrative. If I feel that there's an area that needs more description, I'll either write that in or I could even use the laser tools within PseudoWrite. Lynn, let me go ahead and show my screen again. Okay, I will stop. Uh, I get less picky as the story goes along. I start out, I want the first chapter to be really good. It set the tone for the story. And then I do not generate as many versions in the later chapters. This is an exception. <clears throat> I apologize, guys. I'm still getting over that cold. You this want me is to an talk exception. for a minute so you can drink? Yes. The, the Kit Bash tiplet that I'm using is in Notion. And I can share that with you. You do not need a paid version of Notion to run this. So I will put the link to it in the chat and i think Berlissos is the one that came up with this one <laughs> and i really really appreciate it because i use it a lot so looking at what i did here this is a rare occurrence for me to generate the same chapter over and over again and the reason why i did this is because i wanted to see how many words each one of these different LLMs within PseudoWrite, what kind of word count it would generate for me. So what I did was the same chapter, chapter one, Anthony's first person POV. I have some very basic information for my header and then my beats. I only have a total of 12 beats and I'm using the same beats over and over again. And it's just to test the LLM. And if you notice that using Most Accurate, I ended up with a little over 4,000 words. When I used Best Pros, I ended up with 2,100 words. Balanced, which is GPT-4 Turbo, I had 3,000. I had 2,700 with Fastest. My Unfiltered was 2,900. I did have an error within Goliath back then. But I understand that PseudoWrite has run a fix or patch for that, so I shouldn't have errors there anymore. I actually had some Python leaking through whenever I generated. Now, is it normal to see some bleed through on some of your headers? I've actually seen that off and on since about June, and I'm okay with some of it bleeding through as long as it's given me the pros that I want. Now, the one that surprised me was Araboris gave me 5,000 words. None of that looped, but it took a little bit more liberty than what I would have liked. Now, if maybe I was writing middle grade or a young adult, I might really consider using Araboris for those specific genres. Now, Mythomax gave me 3,600 and Mixtral gave me 2,000. Now, with Mixtral, I recommend with some of these some of these LLMs that are more of the experimental, I recommend rather than giving them the 12 beats at a time, maybe giving them two beats, letting it run that, 
and then giving it two more and then letting it run that. Otherwise, it tends to just really go off the rail because of the type of unfiltered LLM that it is. So again, I find feeding two beats rather than 12 at once to do better for me. So I'm going to go back in and let's take a look at Willow Creek. <clears throat> so in Willow Creek, I do have during a session that I was showing how to use the different LLMs for the different versions. But I can tell you the version that I'm using is always going to be the one that I generate under the most accurate because that se seems to work with my writing style better. If you notice that I only did that during demonstration, and once I hit chapter three, four, and five, those I'm only doing one generation because I already know that when I generate, I'm only going to want to use just the pros here. Now, one of the things that I want to show you is look at my beats for one and two. The sun dipped low in the sky as I pulled into the fire station parking lot. I want to show you how you can get rid of the sun dipping. If you look up here, I don't have any note up here stating anything about my time. So I do have day and time, Monday, 5 p.m. But I did not make a little statement there in parentheses that says to ignore the sun or to not use the sun. But in some of my prior generations, I did that. See how I mentioned avoid mentioning the sun? That little snippet right there, whenever I generated here, started from I could feel the disturbance in the forest before I saw it. Willow Creek Forest had been my home and sanctuary. There is nothing to do with sun dipping or sun rising. So again, if you were looking to try and kill that and every single one of your generations has something to do with the sun filtering in or dipping or rising or anything to do with the sun and you don't want it there, something as simple as saying avoid mentioning the sun works for me. So are there any thoughts, questions? I know that I use quite a bit of header information, which you will see here. I do like to use my story element location because I like to really direct the LLMs. Now, this is a style that works for me. And again, play around with the different styles that people use to see what works for you. I like to really direct the LLM. I like to tell it right down to world building setting, 15% description. I want a 10% in my conflict. I want action. I want backstory. I have 5% romance development here because my characters finally meet. But if I look at some of the romance development early on, you'll notice that here, it stated five to six, five to 10. But then in other generations, I played with it because I wanted to know how I could play with this. Now, if I wanted to turn that off, I could put 0% here if they are not going to have any romantic involvement in that first chapter. I can turn that off. So again, I like to be able to move and restructure my content. I like to basically tell the LLM what it is that I'm looking for. Here I have 5% for my romance development. I have 7% for my backstory about Luke's history with the demon. I want to have only 3% for foreshadowing. Again, this is how I look at story structure. And whenever I'm writing, even if I'm not using AI to write with, this is how my brain functions. And I think about how much I want to use within my specific chapter. How much tension do I have? Is it a fight scene? Is it external or is it internal? 
is, do I need to set the world or have I already shown the world that my character is in and can then focus on my character development? Again, I have 15% character development here because of Luke's internal conflict. Again, this is how I like to play with the LLM and how I like to guide it. Are there any questions at this time? Not in the chat. Okay. So again, find what works for you. Again, when I'm playing with the LLMs, I may, what works for one story may not work for maybe a future story. What I do here in Willow Creek may not actually work inside of my middle grade or inside of my, maybe my erotic billionaire story. So again, think of your story, what the needs of your story are and how you can enhance that and how you can use the LLM to help guide that content for you. Now, talking about Willow Creek, we've played around with it quite a bit. Now I want to show you some of the things that you can do with Willow Creek or with any of your specific bodies. Now, if you have chat GPT-4, it's as simple as asking the LLM to create an image of Lena Murphy. And then I gave the LLM the different descriptions of my character. This way, it can generate an image of the character that I can use repetitively. Now I know anytime I'm describing Lena, I know what my character looks like. And I can be as descriptive as I want to when I am creating these descriptions of my characters. Same thing with a town or city. Now, one thing you'll notice is here on the images that it generates, it doesn't always get wording correct here, but I'm more interested in the image of the character so that I can be consistent. Same thing here with Luna Martinez. If you look, it states that her appearance and age, she's a vibrant woman in her mid-30s with long black hair, and she has an enigmatic presence. She has attributes for being insightful, intuitive. She's discreet. So again, she, I want something that's going to embody who she is. Now, she is the owner of Mystic Brew Coffee. And if you look at the background, it has something to do with a coffee shop. Now, could I ask the LLM to give me the inside of, say, Luna's coffee shop? I can. So let's see. And let's see what that does. Now, again, this is just a resource for me, and I'm collaborating with the LLM. If the LLM generates something that I'm not okay with, then I'll just ask it to continue to generate until I get something that I want. Or I can then describe, I don't always have to use a picture. I can also just use my description, which works fine for me as well. Find the process that works for you. Now, as far as fleshing out my body of work, I like to keep all of my Willow Creek stuff in one area. So if I'm working on a specific body of work, I like to keep everything together. Now let's ask it to go inside. So I'm going to want it to create another image. And as you see, I'm not even using huge props. I'm just using something extremely basic to prompt the LLM. Now, this has a little bit of a steampunk vibe to it. If I didn't want steampunk and I wanted it to be historical, then I would use those specific keywords. And next week, we're actually going to have 
more information on using LLMs to help you create your book covers and promotional content. Lynn does quite a bit with promoting and marketing, and she uses quite a bit of LLMs, different programs to help her with some of the artwork that she generates. Just something as simple as asking the LLM to create, let's see, create the following image, go inside the coffee shop and show the interior of the shop, tables, chairs, and counters. It provided like little couches. I can see the tables. I can see the counter. Again, this gives me the opportunity to describe the body. And if I'm in a shared world, I can share that with everyone else. And that information can be put into the original file for everybody else to be able to draw from and add their descriptions because it keeps the world consistent. Are there any questions? Nothing shows up in the chat. Okay. So let me go ahead and grab my PowerPoint. So we talked about Willow Creek, and we talked about how you can actually use AI to help in the collaboration process. Daily, I am using AI. AI is enabling me to go in and brainstorm an idea. It's allowing me to take that concept and flesh it out into a synopsis, from a synopsis into an outline, into story beats, into prose. Not only does it help me with the concept overall, but then I can also collaborate with the AI and I can use it for editing. I can ask it to give me the strengths and the weaknesses of my body of work. I can ask it to do a developmental or an editorial edit of my body of work. Claude is actually really good for that because I can upload, say, 40, 50,000 words in a document, upload it to Claude and ask Claude specific questions about my body of work, whether it has gaps, what loose threads are still open, what threads have I closed, if there is, if it finds any discrepancies in maybe some of the content that I've put in there, or if I have conflicting information. It's a great way to go in and have a second set of eyes on something. But remember, the AI is only using predictive indexing. It can look at your body of work, but it's never going to be able to look at it the same way that you can as a human. While the LLM provides some great information, you should not rely on the AI 100%. Again, you are the creative you are the author, and as an author, it is your job to go in and scrub your manuscript. Look for those inconsistencies. Now, can you use AI to help you in that area? 100%. But again, the AI is not error-proof. Sometimes it can generate information that may not be 100% factual. It can miss elements that a human eye will actually find. So again, take that in mind when you are using AI to collaborate with. The other thing that and we that, talked about that's today exactly was... exactly how I did my chapter that was good turned into better, is I took mm -hmm. the chapter that I kitbashed and I took it into Claude and I asked it for the weaknesses, what needs to be fleshed out. And between what it said and what I wanted... I did a lot of the rewriting myself, and in some cases, I asked for Claude to either expand a description or something, but that was my step after I did the kit bashing. Definitely, and again, so Lynn used the AI to collaborate with, to use as a writing tool to help her with her editing. Now, you can also use a critique partner. If, say, Lynn and I are writing in Willow Creek, we can do chapter swaps and we can give each other feedback. Again, be open to the different things that are out there and the different avenues and tools that help you as a writer. Now, shared, sharing some experiences and best practices in a group 
really helps because there are things that Lynn does, like with her kit bashing, that might help other writers. And that's why it's so important to be part of a community that fosters growth and learning. And that is one thing that eGlobal does really well. They actually have for their writers, they have an area for their writers to go in, to communicate, to talk about their goals, to talk about some of those areas that might, that they might have some difficulty with. And that community of writers reaches out to one another and provides feedback. And it's great to be part of a community where writers reach out and help one another. I am opening up the Q&A. Are there any questions at this time? Questions, thoughts? I'll give people a few minutes to type in the chat. There's nothing there now. But we want Just to hear a quick comment, think. though. Not a question. It's Gaylene again. I, all this time I've been thinking about how good this would be for everybody, but um, particularly for new writers who aren't as experienced with building their world. It's already there for them. And they can go in and they can see how many times as they're going through their story, how many times they refer back to that collaborative world. So I really love this idea. It's very cool. And I love it as a learning experience. When I was a fledgling writer, a new writer, Gailey, working with, say, Cece and other people, it was a good experience for me because it taught me how to build a world. It taught me how to keep that consistency, and it also gave me a safe place to ask questions. And that was so, so helpful to me as a writer, because writing in your dark little cave, whatever you want to call your writing space, it can get really lonely. And knowing that you have a group that you can reach out to, it's just huge. And again, I, I can't say it enough. I, I think it's great that eGlobal provides a Discord that people can communicate and they can talk. And then, of course, the authors who are contracted can go into teams and talk with each other. Again, finding a community that supports you and helps you grow, phenomenal. Are there any questions in the queue, Lynn? There are no, okay. You must have explained things so wonderfully. Either that or people are thinking, what yeah. did I just see? Maybe they're overwhelmed. Conclusion. Today, we talked about the about AI's role and how you can use it in collaborative writing. Now, with whether you are using AI to brainstorm with or you are using it to build a shared world where you and other writers can work together and expand on that knowledge, find what works for you. Find that space that is comfortable for you to learn in. We also talked about that shared world of Willow Creek and the co-writing benefits with Cece and I and Lynn Jordan and I, if we didn't collaborate on products and didn't write or co-write on things, we wouldn't be moving content out as fast as we are. But again, not only do we have our collaborative work and our co-written work, but we also have our individual writing that we still focus on. And some of that individual writing is on names that we had prior to AI. So I still find myself writing projects without AI. And I use a lot of voice dictation for those because I feel like since I started some of those series prior to AI, I want to continue to write without AI on those. Does that mean that I'm not going to go in and maybe plot with an AI? 100%. I'll probably plot in there and use it for the organization. But when it comes to prose, for those projects that I've maybe been working on since 2012 and releasing updates on frequently, those bodies, I will probably continue to write the prose without AI. But some of my newer works, 100%, I am using AI to generate that prose with. So find what works for you and don't feel that you can't find your voice. Your voice is there and AI can help you find that. And one thing that I want to express to you, when I write my dark mafia bodies of work versus my sweet academy or maybe my middle grade works, my voice changes from genre to genre. And that's okay. I'm not going to want to write something 
that is really gritty and dark and just sexually charged and a young adult for teens. I can definitely keep that in my mafia or in my billionaire for adults, but my writing style will change to fit the genre. So always keep that in mind if you're writing in multiple genres, that your writing voice can change depending on the genre that you are writing in. Looking at key points on critique partners and writing tools. Again, critique partners, I can't express how essential they can be for refining your writing. While tools like Google Docs and specialized software enhance that collaboration process against instances, again, there's nothing that can't even if you use AI, it's great. Don't get me wrong. I love using AI, but there's nothing like having a critique partner, a living, breathing person giving you feedback on a body of work. But if you are doing chapter swaps with somebody and providing feedback, make sure that you're giving as much feedback as you are receiving. That's what makes a really good critique partner, making sure that push and pull that give and take is equal on both sides. So are there any questions or thoughts on critique partners, writing tools? Not yet. Now, I don't know if anybody in here actually writes scripts. If you are a script writer and you also write, say, novels, if you already are a member of, say, uh, Final Draft, which is a script writing software, Final Draft allows you to actually collaborate. So this is one way that CC and I work frequently is if we have a novel, we can put our novel content, our concept inside of Final Draft, and I can send her a code where she can go in and take a look at it. She can write notes on it. If we are flipping that novel into a script, again, we can share through Final Draft. We can share that concept back and forth, and we can make notes on that content. There are so many different writing programs out there that allow you to collaborate with your writing partners. Finding one that works for you is pivotal making sure that you're comfortable with the tools that you're using. Again, with this conclusion and recap, keep the insights in mind as you embark on your collaborative journey and whether you decide to write with another person or just collaborate with AI, find what works for you. As we conclude today's session, I want to thank everyone for participating and I want to thank you, Lynn, for um, assisting me today. And again, this is our sixth session of the eGlobal Writing Salon, and I have enjoyed every single one of these sessions, and I look forward to the next couple of sessions. Gaylene, at this time, I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to you. All right. Thank you very much. I have to agree with you. These have been fantastic sessions. I'm sorry, there's only, there's two left, so we still have some <laughs> Uh, fun stuff to come, but it's coming closer to the close. Really going to miss having these sessions every Wednesday once they're done. But we will have the the link for this coming up at the end of the week. And we'll let everybody know for next week what our topic is and where the link is for our Zoom call. And I want to thank, thank you again, of course, Marigold, for all the work you put into this, sharing this with us. It's just fantastic. And Lynn, thank you very much for helping out and your insights today. I love seeing your work there as well. So thank you both of you and thank you to everyone who attended, whether you're new to this or not, we do this every week. So we will see you next week, we hope, and everyone have a fantastic day. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody.